Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the first webinar in our new Plante Presents Global Plant Science Talk series. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few things just to make sure you get the most out of attending today's webinar. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please let us know about those using the chat box or by emailing me at kayrogers at ASPB.org. If you have questions during today's webinar, please let us know using the GoToWebinar chat box. Questions are submitted anonymously and will be read by our moderator and answered periodically during the webinar as we transition from one topic to the next. If you are having trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early for any reason, do know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all the associated materials within a few days. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for the global plant science community. We would like to give a special thank you to all of our ASP members who are attending today. Your ASPB dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code PRESENTS10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we preside at ASPB.org. As I mentioned earlier, this seminar is the first in our new virtual research seminar series, which was initiated thanks to the efforts of Benjamin Schwesinger and Jaren Kleinman as a response to the closure of many universities due to the COVID-19 virus. Please visit our webpage for more information on this series and sign up if you would like to be considered as a speaker. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm now going to turn it over to Jurgen to introduce our speaker and moderate today's session. Thanks a lot, Katie. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome you um, also here for this nice Plant Science Global Seminar Series. Um, and just a couple of, of sentences um, that I would like to, to share with you on, uh, on Ortelin. Um, I'm very happy that, that uh, she can join us today and uh, she, she entitled her talk a long distance uh, talk about long distance signaling. I think that's the perfect uh, title for, for what we're doing here. And you know, we, we are facing this COVID-19 outbreak and we are all isolated. So I think we are very happy to have this virtual uh, plant science and, and listen uh, to, to Ottolin. But I believe also once we, we re I've lost your audio. Yeah, it looks like like Jurgen's audio cut out, right? Are you still able to hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, now now I can. Uh oh, it looks like. Share my screen. Uh, okay. Um, and she um did a a postdoc with uh, with uh, let's say the oxen guru Mark Castell uh back then at, at Indiana University. Um, and since then, she made great discoveries, um, also with, with her own lab that, that she then founded initially in, in York on canonical auxin um, receptor and uh, also insights into strigolactone signaling and, and shoot branching. Um, by now, Ottoline uh, is a director of the Sainsbury Labo Laboratory at, at Cambridge University, so she kind of closed the circle here. Um, and she created a truly special place for. Um, uh, research on plant development over there. Um, very beautiful to see. Uh, she received enormous amounts of, of honors and, and awards, and uh, I will just refer here to Wikipedia to check them out if you if you want to. She's a fellow of the Royal Society, um, and even though you see right now she's not uh, wearing the the neck decoration. Uh, in in 2017, she was appointed a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire. I think this just uh, reflects how impressive her achievements are. And with this, uh, Ottoline, I would thank you for once again for accepting our invitation, and uh, I invite you to take this virtual stage here. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and close all of these windows. I hope everybody can see my slide and hear my voice. And I'd like to thank Jürgen and Benjamin very much for organising this series, which I think is a brilliant idea, and Pante and ASPB for making it um, possible. So um, uh, it's a great honour to be able to kick off the series with this talk. And what I would like to do really is um, present the kind of core logic around the ideas that my lab's been working on for a number of years and um, uh, present, uh, also a little bit of uh, the, the context for why I think that's important and some of course of the data um, that underpin those um, concepts. Okay, so um, let's go. Uh, okay, it's not working. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do now because it's not responding to my keyboard anymore. Yeah. Are you able to click directly on the slide uh, with your mouse? Let's let's try that. Um, yeah, but then I can't get rid of that window. But that's all right. I'll cope with that. Good. Okay. <laughs> so let's go. So um, <clears throat> plants, because of the way they collect up their resources, um, which would be sunlight and carbon dioxide, and um, below ground water and mineral nutrients, have to have this very large surface area below ground, and as a result, they're immobile, as indeed many of us are at the moment, stuck in our homes. And, but plants aren't even allowed out once a day for food. They have to get it locally where they are. And this immobility has really creates two key problems for plants that they have to solve and evolution has done a great job of solving that and those two problems are that they have to deal with whatever environment they happen to be in that they, they have to cope rather than move and um, inability to move also makes you a, a, a sitting duck to any kind of predator so that's illustrated by this slug it's um not something that a person would be very frightened of, but for a plant, as you know, if you're a gardener, it's potentially devastating. So these two problems that arise from this um, same cause of immobility have been solved in an extraordinarily cunning way that is intimately connected to the whole logic underpinning plant growth and development. And oops, I have to remember to do it that way. And <clears throat> that uh, is through modularity. So plant development, and this is particularly obviously in the shoot system, is incredibly modular. So um, the shoot apical from my stem here um, is a, a dome of cells at the growing tip of the plant, and it is dividing and producing the plant underneath it and being pushed up um, on the cells that it's made. And um, the way it works is to churn out these modules that are termed phytomers, and they consist of um, the stem, under the marrow stem and uh, at the flank and a lateral organ, for example, a leaf, and crucially in the axle of that leaf, a whole nother marrow stem, which has the same developmental potential as the primary marrow stem. And so you can think of a shoot as being made of a series of these phytomers, a bit of stem, an organ, and an axillary marrow stem. And these axillary marrow stems, as I say, have the same developmental potential as the primary marrow stem, so they can activate and grow out and make a whole another branch which recapitulates the development of the of the, the primary shoot so there is this extraordinary flexibility of form that the shoot system has as a result of its modularity because both the number of modules that are made um, can vary the timing with which they are made and actually there are a lot of different types of module that the plant can flip through during its life cycle and so huge flexibility from this modularity and at the same time, because of the modularity, there are no unique parts. So any one part of this plant can be eaten by that slug and there are um, parts to replace it. So modularity provides simultaneously flexibility or, or plasticity and um, uh, robustness to predation. But it also immediately creates a problem. And that problem is there are no unique parts. So there is no possibility of a, of a single central coordinating center to regulate that um, flexibility that I, that I talked about. That the regulation of, of the behavior of all these meristems and modules has got to be done in a distributed way with no central control. 
and um, that's in stark contrast to uh, animal behaviors for example where we're used to central processing in a brain if you're a plant having a brain is a really stupid idea because it'll be eaten and then um, that will be the end of you so <coughs> We, in, in the context of the shoot system, the, the system um, we work on in my lab as an example of this extraordinary job that plants do um, is shoot branching control. So fundamentally about the activity of those secondary axillary meristems. And, and as you can see here, some Arabidopsis plants growing either with limited nutrient availability where they make very few branches or with high nutrient availability, in this case nitrogen, where they make a lot more branches. And the key question is how do, how do each one of those axillary meristems know what to do? Why is it that this meristem in this leaf here on low nitrogen is not making a branch, whereas it's equivalent um, here is making a branch, but the, the, the node immediately above is making a branch in both situations. So how does each one of those meristems make this decision that is uh, at some level an integrated whole plant decision, but made locally and with no central control. So we're interested in the coordination of meristem activity across the shoot with no central processing. How, how can that work? And this job of um, coordinated meristem activity is a, a really extraordinary thing that plants are able to do. And one of my favorite experiments of all time I think illustrates that really well. And this is this experiment done by the Snows in the 1930s. Um, they developed a huge amount of really um, underpinning understanding of how shoot branching control works, working very largely um, in, in these two branched pea or bean systems. So the so way um, these two branch systems work is you germinate a bean plant and um, after it's been growing for a little while, you chop the top off here. And, um, uh, leaving only the cotyledonary nodes, and they each have one of these axillary meristems, and those will grow out and make a branch. And, and they will both grow out and make a branch, so you'll wind up with two equal branches. And in this experiment, what they, the um, snows then did was remove one of those branches above its first node, so it's got some leaves and some axillary um, buds um, there associated with it, and then they asked what happened to these axillary buds. And if this branch is, if you only cut off one of the branches, so this branch is still strong and active and vigorous, this bud is inhibited and it doesn't go out. If you cut off both the branches, then on both sides, um, the buds will activate. So this bud, this active branch here is able to inhibit the activity of this bud here. And this is the case even if you take the entire plant and from its um, birth, you divide it up the middle so that um, the, the stem is split to above this, this node. And um, this I find um, quite extraordinary. The, the, the motivation for doing this experiment was to prove that it wasn't to do with nutrient competition between these two um, um, branches, because here the nutrients supplied to this branch are coming up from this part of the root system, and the ones supplied to this branch are coming up to this part of the root system. So there is no competition, no direct competition for nutrients between these branches and yet this branch can inhibit this branch. And so somehow or other, there is essentially information flow um, that goes down this shoot, up this shoot, down that, and up the other side. And this is um, this path of, of, of information flow traces a W, and so this is quite commonly referred to as a W experiment, and I, I find it really inspirational. And it's also a very basic experiment. If you happen to be trapped at home for any reason, you can, you can do this with your favorite houseplant and see if it works. So um, what could this information flow be? Well, um, we've been working for a long time on the idea that it's hormones, plant hormones, and particularly in the context of downward information flow, the really obvious candidate is auxin. Um, so here's auxin. It's synthesized in young expanding leaves in active shoot apices, so it's um, very much a kind of signal for a happy, healthy apex making a lot of leaves. And it's exported from leaves and transported basically down the plant in this um, very strong directional way and that directionality, that polarity is um, uh, attributed and indeed demonstrably attributed to members of the pin family of auxin efflux carrier and they are basally located on files of cells in the stem, particularly um, if we're talking about pin one, the xylem parenchyma and, and um, uh, vascular cambium and this basal location of pin is responsible for the basic people transport of auxin um, straight down the plant, um, right down to the root. 
And um, this auxin moving in this so-called polar auxin transport stream is able to inhibit the activity of the axillary meristems in, in the leaves um, as, as, it, as it goes by. And it is as it goes by because um, uh, we know that uh, uh, radio labeled auxin applied apically is transported right down the plant to the root. Very little of it goes into the bud, but we know that that auxin can inhibit the activity of axillary meristem from the kind of classic um, time and then skew decapitation experiments. If you chop the top of the plant, the bud will activate. If you chop the top of the plant and supply an apical auxin source, it may start growing a little bit, but then it will be inhibited. And um, so this apical auxin supply is crucial for keeping this bud off. And it does it somehow indirectly because it doesn't move up into the bud to inhibit it directly. So um, <laughs> how might that work? So uh, for many years now, we've accumulated quite a substantial body of evidence, in, um, along with a number of other people, obviously, um, that a key uh, component of the regulatory system that allows auxin moving in the polar auxin transport stream in the stem, which is kind of cartooned here, to inhibit the activity of this axillary bud indirectly as a result of this um, uh, interesting phenomenon that was uh, first proposed by Svi Sachs that is called auxin transport canalization. And what we hypothesize is for, that for this bud to grow in a sustained way, it has to be able to export auxin out into the main stem. So it has to establish its own polar auxin transport stream, exporting auxin away from its um, active apex out into the stem. And that establishment of a polar auxin transport stream between the bud and the stem proceeds by a canalization-like process. So um, what is that? So the, the core um, idea of auxin transport canalization is that if you have an auxin source, a strong auxin source, and um, an active apex would be a strong auxin source. And if you have an auxin sink, and um, the stem is a great auxin sink because it's carrying the auxin away um, down to the root, then um, you will see an initial passive movement of auxin between this source and this sink. And that passive flux will both polarize and upregulate active auxin transporters in the pin family. So positive feedback between auxin flux and pin polarization that will lead to the gradual establishment of a strong, highly polar auxin transport um, pathway connecting this source, which is now an active apex, out to the sink. And we think this can work really effectively um, as an indirect mechanism whereby auxin moving in the main stem can inhibit this bud because the more auxin there is in the main stem, the weaker this sink is. And the weaker this sink is, the less of an initial flux there'll be from this apparently initially weak source because this is not an active apex, so there are no young expanding leaves. It's a, um, it's a potential source, but a weak source as, an, as a dormant bud. And so now you have a, a weak source and a, and a um, weak sink, and this is not enough to drive the positive feedback that um, establishes polar auxin transport between the source and the sink. Whereas, whereas when you chop the top of the plant, as in those classic experiments, and this auxin in the main stem drains away, this becomes a strong sink and will um, uh, therefore allow a, a greater auxin flow out of the bud, which will begin to activate and will then upregulate its source strength as well as it makes more and more leaves. So you have um, these multiple positive feedbacks in the system that um, drive the bud to activation as a result of um, auxin depletion from the main stem. So that's the core model that we work on, and um, there's, there's a range of evidence that support it. Um, but the, the, the reason, in some ways, that I, I like it very much as a mechanism, and I have to conf confess I, I like it as a kind of visceral level, is because of the properties it has. It has a, a number of really interesting properties for understanding um, how uh, plants are able to tune their development in this distributed way with no central control. And that's because effectively what's going on is that all the apices on the shoot system are competing for access to uh, a common auxin transport path um, down to the root. And that competition is mediated by the positive feedback of auxin transport canalization. And that means that, that, that the competition has within it reinforcement, because if you're winning the competition and you're exporting your auxin, um, you're, you are establishing growth and more auxin, and you're also taking up um, auxin, uh, active, auxin pathway in the stem effectively. So you're, you're reducing um, the ability of other buds to export their auxin into the stem. So competition with reinforcement is really at the heart of the 
the mechanism by which every single shoot apex can communicate with one another um, mediated in this auxin transport system in this positive feedback um, element in the auxin transport system and competition with reinforcement is an absolute classic regulatory architecture for self-organizing systems so it is exactly the sort of thing that's going to give you distributed processing of information with no um, central control and you can think about that in terms of how you might integrate information into this system um, either by, for example, increasing the source auxin source strength of the bud, so a, a high quality light environment might drive auxin synthesis in the bud and increase its source, source strength. We've already talked about um, stem sink strength, and then I'll mention at the end a number of um, factors that feed in and um, change the parameters in the in canalization by tuning the rate at which pins accumulate on the plasma membrane, therefore making it easier or harder for buds to establish this canalized pathway out into the stem. So it has these very interesting properties. It, it creates a kind of relative system because it's all about competition, not exactly how much of hormone do you have. Um, and in, it's very um, tunable dynamically. It's a continuous process and you can integrate systemic information, for example, systemically changing the, the, the way feedback works in the feedback loop and local information, for example, locally changing blood source strength. So it, it has absolutely all the properties that a, a plant would need to do this job of, of mediating communication between every single apex with no um, central control. So as I say, there's a, a variety of, of, of evidence to support this. Um, a lot of it's correlative. So um, if you have an inactive bud and you look at pin proteins here, um, fused to the green fluorescent protein um, on the, uh, in the bud stem, um, in an inactive bud, you can see fluorescence, but it's not polar. And really a very early event within a few hours of bud activation is the polarization of this pin um, in, in the, um, to, to generate the polar auxin transport stream in the bud stem, carrying the auxin out into the main stem. So um, we have, in collaboration with Jemek Pushin Kievich a number of years ago, built a model to see, but really to help us with the intuition about how the system might behave at a whole plant level. So we've uh, modeled uh, uh, essentially phytomas as, as kind of like a giant cell like this with a certain amount of auxin, which is this green square, and then the neighboring phytoma here um, will be receiving the auxin, and this white bar represents the amount of flux of auxin from here to here. And the more flux there is, the more pin proteins the model will stick into this membrane. And of course, the more pin proteins there are in the membrane, the more flux there will be. So that's the key positive feedback in the system. And um, you can write the maths like this, which is a very simple equation that says the rate of change of pin proteins in the membrane, so these red things, um, is equal to the amount of pin going in, and that's these two terms, and the amount of pin coming out, and that's this term. And the amount coming out is very simple. It's just a proportion of the pin that's in there every time. And that proportion is um, dictated by this parameter, the pin decay constant mu. The amount of pin going in is more interesting. It's got two parts, a basal insertion rate. But this is the bit that really drives the system because this is insertion proportional to the flux across the membrane. So that's the key um, uh, kind of tenet of the canalization hypothesis that you have flux correlated allocation of pins. And that um, proportionality is, is sigmoidal. This is the Hill function. And it's the interaction between this sigmoidal insertion and this linear removal that gives the system this um, very clean switch-like property that we'll see later that allows buds to be off or on, depending on whether they've managed to drive this canalization process to fixation. So you can build a little plant out of, out of this model. Here's the root. And here's the little seedling, and this is the phytoma, and this is how much auxin it has, and this is its basal pin, and this is the flux, and this little green dot is its meristem. We've not included the leaves in this model, and when you run this model, um, this is what happens. You build a shoot, and the shoot has canalized auxin transport from the apex down to the root, and it produces lateral buds, which are exactly the same as this here, um, but those lateral buds fill up with auxin, but the flux from the bud into the main stem is very low, and that's not sufficient to drive canalization and establish polarized pins. And so these buds we declare to be inactive. And then if you wait for the plant to flower, which it does in the model, you see something interesting happening, which is that um, we model that at flowering, the shoot apex no longer makes a lot of auxin. And so this auxin 
uh, um, will drain away in the main stem and at some point you'll get little enough orcs in here that the flux between here and here will be high enough to drive um, uh, um, activation of the bud, which you can see now. So you see a relay of, of successive um, buds activating one after the other um, uh, as they canalize their own auxin transport out into the into the shoot. And this um, relay is exactly what you see in Arabidopsis plants. You see a, a basipetal sequence of bud activation at flowering, and that basipetal sequence will stop at some point. And that point is the point at which the residual auxin produced by um, all of these active apices is enough to accumulate um, to the level that it will stop the next bud. This particular version of the simulation is set so that, that that level is never high enough and every bud will activate, but you can tune that parameter in the model and you'll see this basipetal sequence that stops at some point. And in the max associated um, with this uh, model that relates to these two stable equilibria, a stable equilibrium um, where there's no change in flux, it's stable um, at very low flux and the bud is off, or one at very high flux and the bud is on, and all those points in between are unstable. Um, once you go past this tipping point, you wind up at the stable on state. And we can see this switching property very clearly in the data when you look at the way that buds activate in Arabidopsis. And you can also see another key property of this kind of system, which is so-called hysteresis. Once you've switched the thing on into this stable state, it becomes much more difficult to switch it back off again. So um, uh, just some data that uh, uh, support those two assertions. So here's a bud that we've isolated on a node and we're feeding apical auxin in through the top. Here is the bud and, um, and the bud is gonna activate. Um, and uh, if you add a increasing amounts of apical auxin, it becomes inhibited. But what you can see very clearly is that um, what's going on here is that um, the, the, inhib the inhibition is a delay in, in the, the, the rapid growth of the bud. Once the bud's activated, it grows just as rapidly if there's apical auxin as if there isn't. And that's the case even if you have a very high level of auxin, this is 10 micromolar auxin. Here it looks as though you've got slow bud growth, but you haven't. What you've got is a mixture of buds that haven't activated and a mixture of buds that have and the ones that have are growing at exactly the same rate as, as um, the ones that um, activated on no, with no apical auxin. And that's shown here where we've aligned every single bud that's activated at the same time point when it was five millimeters, when the, the, the day on which it reached five millimeters. And you can see all of the lines um, are identical regardless of whether or not there's auxin. So that's this clear switching property. And if we do that kind of experiment and then add back auxin, at various points, then we can see that in an intact situation where you don't chop the top off, by the end of the experiment here, um, no buds are active, essentially. Um, when you chop the top off, by the end of the experiment, virtually all the buds are active and are growing at, um, uh, at a fast rate. Um, if you add apical auxin immediately, then you return to this everybody stays dormant. Um, at one day, it's very similar, but by the time you get to two days, three days, and four days after decapitation, that apical auxin is no longer able to inhibit the bud. And those buds, once they're activated, grow at exactly the same rate. So any of the activated buds there are will grow at the same rate, regardless of, of which treatment they're in. So um, I, I hope that convinces you that this system um, provides a very uh, clean way for, but for, for the plants to decide which buds are off and which buds are on in a way that's sensitive to the behavior of all the buds on the plant. So as I say, all of these buds are competing with one another for access to this common auxin transport path down to the root, and they can be tuned in multiple ways um, a, a across this system. And um, so if you go back to the example I gave at the beginning where plants grow, are grown on low nitrogen, the stopping point is essentially what's being tuned. So either a small number of, of, of buds, these two most apical ones are activated, or that um, sequence goes for longer right down into the rosette. And many of the um, mechanisms by which that tuning happens rely on tuning the behavior of pin proteins in the system. So um, just two super quick slides of examples of that. Um, cytokinin um, synthesis in the root is upregulated on high nitrogen. And if you can't, and, and you can see that 
um, plants growing on high nitrogen are branchier than plants growing on low nitrogen. And if you take out members of the cytokine and biosynthesis um, enzyme family IPT, eventually you get to the point where the plant is unable to respond to the high nitrogen. It's branching normally on low nitrogen, but on high nitrogen it can't respond because it doesn't have that extra cytokine added. And if you um, mess with the signaling pathway, also can't respond. And that is associated with the fact that cytokinin stabilizes pin proteins on the plasma membrane. So here's pin three after cytokinin treatment stabilized on the plasma membrane and on, uh, under low nitrate treatment, it's stripped off the plasma membrane associated with the lower cytokinin in that situation. And strigolactone, a whole different hormone, also sensitive to nutrient availability in the root, also required um, for the ability of plants to put this in, in the other in the opposite sign here, um, strigolactone suppresses branching on low nitrogen, and it does that in part by promoting pin removal. Now, cytokinin can affect all of these pins, whereas strigolactone very specifically acts only on pin one and pin seven. This is us monitoring the amount of pin on the membrane through um, um, GFP tags after treatment with the synthetic strigolactone, GR24. So, um, you can you can draw both of these kind of circuit diagrams for cytokinin and strigolactone in much the same way. Um, auxin is moving in the polar transport stream. It's preventing the establishment of a polar transport stream out of the bud. Um, if you add a lot of cytokinin, and interestingly, there's a feedback here where auxin represses the synthesis of, of cytokinin, then cytokinin will promote that positive feedback um, uh, uh, between um, pin it drives extra pin accumulation on the plasma membrane in response to flux because it stabilizes pins on the plasma membrane and allow um, buds to activate in, in a situation where otherwise they wouldn't. So when um, high nitrogen comes along, this system is equilibrated in a different place than when um, the system is, is growing in low nitrogen. So you can view this set of interlocking feedback loops between auxin, um, uh, its transport, cytokinin and strigolactone is really a, a, a system that is endlessly sensing and tuning the environment and allowing the plant to adjust its branching um, accordingly. And so if you map it back onto this rather fancifully, because we really don't have the data to support this, but one might imagine that this downward signal is auxin, this upward signal might be strigolactone and, and or cytokinin. We have no idea really how that would move over the top. We can speculate, but we don't have any idea. But probably auxin coming down the other side, because that's the only thing we know about that comes down in that way. And then, as I've described to you, auxin in the main stem can indirectly inhibit the activity of a bud by um, um, modulating the export of auxin from that bud. So um, that's a quick romp through how we think about the, the way that plants do this extraordinary job of coordinating their development with no central control. And um, these are the people in my group who did the work and the people who funded us. And thank you very much for listening. All right. Thanks a lot, Ottilie, for this very nice talk. Um, I will hand over some some questions from the from the audience um bipin pandey uh, asked can we produce ectopic branching by man manipulating hormones such as auxin or strigolactone to increase the biomass or yield um ooh, that's a good question so we can definitely produce um uh, branchier plants from uh, manipulating those hormones. In fact, the, the mutants that identified the strigolactone pathway in the first place um, were identified because they're very, very branchy. Whether you wind up with higher biomass is a slightly different um, question because uh, what tends to happen is the branches are all quite a lot thinner. So you have a lot more branches, but actually the total shoot biomass is much less strongly affected than one might imagine. There is in our experience, a small yield increase. There's more pods and well, more salix and more seeds. So, so I think from an agricultural point of view, it's a it's a, a promising consideration. But then you also have to bear in mind that agriculturally, um, a lot of what's gone on during domestication is precisely the suppression of branching, so that you can plant the crops more densely and and more of the available resources invested into a smaller number of seeds. So you get big juicy seeds instead of lots of small um, little ones. So it it's it, 
from an agricultural point of view, I think we need to understand these pathways and, we, and they can inform both breeding practice, but also agronomic practice when you apply your fertilizer and so on. But um, what the optimal solution is from an agricultural point of view, I think is very crop specific, it depends what you're trying to harvest and how you're trying to um, encourage the plant to invest its resources. Mm -hmm. um, another question on the canalization model from uh, Eric Vollbrecht. Uh, he asked, would the local perturbation of auxin signaling, but not auxin flow, result in effective violation of the model? Um, so, uh, so there, there's a couple of points to, to, to unpick in there. Um, firstly, there is the issue of local perturbation, and I, I, I think that's a really important point because um, it uh the the model as i try to emphasize works on <clears throat> on relative strengths and so if you make a mutant which is typically what we do although you can shift the entire system into a different place in in the parameter space so you get a very branchy plant if you have no strigolactone for example um it, it, you're not changing the 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 you're not straightforwardly changing relative things and so it, it's a little bit hard to predict what you'll get so um, from an auxin signaling point of view, if you reduce auxin signaling, you get a branchy mutant. And um, there are multiple reasons why that is. One of them is you've um, broken the feedback between auxin signaling and the synthesis of strigolactone and the synthesis of cytokinin. So that signaling pathway directly regulates the amount of strigolactone and, and cytokinin that you get. That's one thing. The other thing is auxin synthesis is under feedback inhibition. So if you have an auxin signaling mutant, you wind up with more auxin and then the, the source strength of your bud increases. So you wind up with a branchy plant, but it's branchy for multiple different reasons. And uh, what we have not successfully been able to do yet, despite quite a lot of trying, is locally increase auxin um, synthesis or signaling effectively in, in buds. We've used all kinds of different inducible promoter systems and it hasn't worked. And I think we're going to have to do um, heavy duty chimeras, which is, is quite hard work because just inducing genes in the mutant backgrounds doesn't seem to do it. Mm -hmm. there, there are a couple of questions on um like from Jung Queen Yu is, is wondering about auxin importers. And there are also some questions from, from different people uh, wondering about the different roles of the different pins. And I think also relating to the, the fact that strigolactam and, and cytokinin have different impact on, on different pins and whether there's a different developmental output of that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay, so what was the beginning bit again? I've forgotten. The first one was the auxin influx carriers, whether oh, they also yeah. play a role. <laughs> Absolutely. So the influx carriers, they are really quite interesting um, because uh, they have, if you make um, uh, lax multiple mutant, um, it has quite a strong effect on the ability of the stem to transport auxin, on bulk auxin transport through the stem. It has virtually no effect on branching. And if you make double mutants between those, those uh, influx carrier mutants and, say, a strigolactone mutant, um, you wind up with uh, the strigolactone mutant. It, it, the strig the, they're very branchy. There's no impact of, of low import. On the other hand, if you make multiple mutants between the strigolactone mutant and, and any of the exporters, so if you make a PIN347 strigolactone quadruple mutant, you see quite strong suppression of the branching phenotype. So I think um, what that gets back to is what I was saying earlier about this relative versus absolute. I think if you just globally reduce import, um, it, the system re-equilibrates in much the same place as it was because the dynamics of the system that are, is what um, it was where strigolactone is allowing um, uh, uh, the establishment of, of this polar oxygen transport stream from the bud to the stem through ramping through that positive feedback loop. That dynamics is focused on pins and pin behavior. And so if you compromise that, then you wind up with the strigolactone being unable to do its thing and activate buds. So I think um, I think it's been quite informative to think about the different roles of the influx carriers, which seem to be just providing a background level of movement, and the efflux carriers, which are dynamically changing um, constantly through the through the life cycle of the plant. Mm -hmm. Then 
uh, you asked me about the specificity, which is a, a very exciting thing that we're trying to work on. So um, there are two different things going on. The, the, there are, there, so there are these four pins that are expressed in the stem, one, three, four, and seven. And um, all of those are cytokine insensitive in young stems. In older stems, that, um, at least pin one, which is the only one which is still expressed at really high levels then, is, um, is no longer cytokine insensitive. So it gets locked in um, in older stems. But um, throughout, one and seven is sensitive to stridolactone and three and four aren't. So even in an old stem, one will come off the membrane if you add stridolactone. Um, and so we're hoping that that specificity will actually give us a way in to get to the molecular mechanism by which stridolactone and indeed cytokinin are, are, are uh, modulating how much these things is on the membrane. We've got a lot of domain swap experiments going on. Um, so we can show, for example, that it's the middle region of um, pin one that is required for strigolactone sensitivity because you can stick that into pin three and make it strigolactone sensitive. And then we're very interested in using the lines that we make with those um, domain swapped pins to understand in more detail the relative importance of strigolactone and cytokinin input into that. Um, pin network. Yeah. Krishak Vapnik is, is wondering whether phosphorylation is, is involved in this process. Uh, so the, we, the short answer we don't know. There's a longer answer which is um, so the, the majority of, um, of modulation of pins is indeed so far um, associated with phosphorylation on the large intracellular loop. Um, there's also some evidence for ubiquitination but we, we haven't seen any of that in our system, but we haven't, that's, that's a negative result, so who knows. Um, uh, we've tried, for example, with the strigolactone um, system, where we've got pins that definitely don't respond and pins that definitely do, it gives you a kind of bioinformatic opportunity to try and spot things that correlate with um, strigolactone sensitivity. And there's no really obvious smoking gun. We're quite, um, uh, fixated on a three anine, <laughs> which is in one and seven and not in three and four. But what I can't remember which whether it's three or four has a serine in that position. And in principle, serine and threonine should be interchangeable from a phosphorylation point of view. But in practice, maybe they're not. Um, so, so uh, I, I, it's our null hypothesis that it's something to do with phosphorylation. But there's no really obvious um, site that would um, allow us to move quickly on that hypothesis. All right, maybe the, the last question. I mean, there are a lot of questions that, that, that remain open now, but um, uh, Michael Niemeyer is, is wondering what determines the initial outgrowth of the bud that you mentioned? Um, so that's, uh, that is a very interesting question. So when you chop the top of the plant, um, uh, you see quite rapidly bud expansion and Christine Beveridge's group in P, which has got a lot, much longer stem, <laughs> has shown that at least for the, the, this basal bud, which activates really quickly, um, that that um, activation or that start of the expansion is much quicker than you could account for by a local at the node drop in auxin concentration. And um, her hypothesis is that it's to do with a kind of sugar rush. So um, if you've removed the, the growing apex, which is a major sugar sink, then that the sugar can be redistributed to, to those buds and that sugar um, or uh, maybe trehalose 6-phosphate um, that correlates with that um, is um, what drives a, a really that initial expansion. But um, if you add apical auxin, it will stop, and there isn't a, and there still isn't a sugar sink um, from the apex. So I think that's a um, I think the way that, that the field is moving now is to think of that as a kind of priming step um, rather than a, a go for it step. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot, uh, Ottoline, for the, the beautiful talk and also for the nice discussion with the, with the audience. Thank you. Um, and we leave you um, in, your, in your quarantine at home <laughs> and we get, to, <laughs> we get to the next speaker then. Thanks. Um, and uh, next up is, is Sarah Robinson and she is a Career Development Fellow uh, at the Sainsbury Laboratory in Cambridge. Uh, so we have two speakers from the same um, institute here. 
And uh, Sarah worked with some of the finest plant scientists, let's say, um, out there, including Chris Kuhlemeyers, uh, Enrique Cohen, and, and Elliot Meyerowitz. And uh, now, in, with her own lab, she's particularly interested in, in how cell and then organ size um, are determined. And her group investigates these processes using biomechanics, modeling, and, and genomic approaches. And I'm very much looking forward um, to her talk. And Sarah, I hope you are there. Hi, yep, I'm here. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, not yet, but I hope Katie can help us out there. Can you see them now? Yes, that looks yep, good. Yep, we can see them now. Perfect. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And Oh, sorry, I need to minimize a ton of stuff. I'm having the same problem as Ottilie now. Okay, so. Ah, uh, oh, la la, what is this thing? Sorry. So thank you for the organizers for this invitation and also for organizing this great series so quickly. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the talks. So, uh, yep, I'm uh, Sarah Robinson. I'm from the Sainsbury Laboratory, the same as Ottilie. I'm also a Royal Society fellow, and I'm interested in the mechanics of size and shape. And so these are important things because the size of a plant controls things like yield. It also controls its ability to withstand stresses, like a dwarf wheat. It's much less prone to lodging than a tall wheat, for example. Or if you consider a flower, a larger flower will attract a different pollinator compared to a smaller flower, and this can drive speciation events. Another reason plants are just brilliant to study, among other reasons, is that they have lots of different organs, and these different organs have different sizes and different shapes and different functions. And so things like the flower have a very tight genetic control over their complex shape, whereas things like the hypocotyl have a more simple shape, but they're very susceptible to the environment. And so, we can try and compare the different ways that these are growing in order to learn some general principles. The hypocotyl is one of my favorites at the moment because of the simple nature of its shape. And you can see here the dramatic difference you get if you grow one in the dark or the light. Such a simple change leads to this huge change in the size of the organ. So how do plants grow? Plant growth and morphogenesis in general is simpler than in animals. The cells can't move or rearrange, they don't migrate around the place, so it's a little easier to follow them. Instead, plants develop in a process of cell division and cell expansion. Cell division occurs by adding new material, the new cell wall here, but this doesn't necessarily increase the size of the cell. They also expand, so this depends upon the pressure inside the cell, and then it has a cell wall which surrounds it, and the cell wall expands depending on its properties and also on the anisotropy for example of these fibers this can lead to an increase in the size of the cell but it can have addition of material but it also doesn't need to and so the relationship between cell division and cell expansion is one that remains a little bit uh, complex and is actually the focus of my current lab's work but it's not what i'm going to focus on today And so, as I said, the amount and direction of expansion of a cell depends upon the properties of the cell wall. If you imagine these two walls of the cell being a little softer, then the pressure inside will drive it to expand and it'll create this anisotropic shape. However, the cell wall that surrounds the cells also physically connects them. And so one cell might decide it wants to grow. However, if its neighbors are not uh, going along with it, then it's got a problem. And this can lead to mechanical uh, stresses building up in the tissue. And so here's an example where this central region is trying to grow much faster than the outside region. And this can generate these complex shapes where you get this buckling phenotype. You can also have feedback from these mechanical stresses on the microtubules. Microtubules guide the deposition of those cellulose fibers. And so you end up with different cell wall uh, anisotropic properties being fed into the system. 
And this whole thing is being controlled by big networks of genes, many hormones. And like I said in the beginning, there's these inputs from the environment. So in general, morphogenesis can be challenging to understand. So how am I trying to approach this problem? What I'm doing is trying to characterize the mechanical properties of the growing tissues, and also trying to understand the role of mechanical feedback in informing plant growth. So how do we look at mechanical properties? This is usually the point in the talk where I jump around and grab something and do some kind of demonstration, but that's not really possible just now. So perhaps you can look around your immediate vicinity and select a couple of items. So the way we test mechanical properties is we need to interact with them in some way. We need to deform them and measure the force or apply a force and measure the deformation and then see what it does. So if you take something, I don't know, a hair bubble, a sock, you can pull it and release it and it should go back to the starting uh, size that it had. This is an elastic material. It goes straight back. Um, Perhaps you're sitting on a sofa or a soft chair or a bed. You can press down that. And when you release it, it will go back more gradually. So this has a viscous uh, component. Some things that you deform won't go back, um, or they might go back only partially. This could be um, some Play Doh or something like this. Anyway, feel free to wander around your house and try and. Uh, squash some things and see what kind of properties you can find. But the take home message is that in order to understand the properties of a material, you have to interact with it. You can't just look at it and know what they are. There are some added complications of studying this in biological materials and plants in particular. So the cell wall is a very complex structure in itself. It has these cellulose fibers, there's pectin, there's hemicellulose, there's a lot of things in there. It's not a homogeneous, perfect sort of material. And then you've got the cells themselves, the cell wall is around them, and then these cells are stuck together to make these complex tissues. And so when we're measuring these things, we're getting a, a result from this whole complex thing. It's not really a very uh, simple experiment to do. And so a, a range of techniques have been developed to try and measure these properties. And you kind of need to do a lot of different approaches in order to try and get some insight into what's going on. And the method that you choose will depend a lot upon the type of tissue you're looking at and the type of question you're interested in. For example, indentation techniques are extremely popular for things like meristems, which are not really accessible to a lot of other methods. This gives local information by indenting the surface and measuring the force and the displacement. Things like extensometers are more suitable for longer type things where you can attach each end and really pull on it. Whereas a parallel plate is more suitable for a single cell, like a protoplast or something like this. And all of these techniques can be used to extract different bits of information about the properties. Because I'm interested in hypocotyls, which are relatively elongated in shape and they tend to grow in one direction, I use extensometers. They can be attached uh, at both ends and then you pull on them. You can measure how much they deform. And I connected a setup with a load cell, which measures force, in a feedback loop so that I can say I want to apply a certain amount of force and then measure how much deformation there is. And so we can program this to apply certain forces, and then we can use little marks that we find on the surface of the sample to track how much it's deformed. And this enables us to compute some of the properties of this tissue. By using these points, we can get more accurate information about how the sample's deforming. And I attached this to a confocal microscope so that we could try and get cellular resolution out of it. Here you can see the objective, and you've got the, the two plates here. The sample goes here between the two, and this plate can move. So this is the one controlling how much deformation you get. 
and then this one is connected to the load cell and they're linked up in a feedback loop so we can tell it again what target force we want and it will move until it puts that much force on the sample and you can see this kind of image where you can see every cell getting deformed and you can see how much these cells are getting deformed and their change in width and their change in length so we can use image processing tools to extract information from these types of images and so as an example i wanted to see what would happen to the properties of the tissue if we applied something like the growth hormone gibberellic acid so if cells are grow if if you treat a hypocotyl with gibberellic acid then they're longer so this is the blue line here this is a ga treated you've got this control one which is the red one and then I plotted cell length against distance from the base of the plant. And so the cells at the top have grown a lot more than the cells at the bottom compared to the control. And so most of this elongation is caused by the cells at the top growing more. And so then we put the plant into the extensor meter and we did a creep test. So we applied a force and held it while we collected confocal images. And then we measured the amount of deformation in each cell along the length of the hypocotyl. And that's what I'm plotting here. This is a heat map of the percentage strain in length of each cell along the hypocotyl. And so you can see in the control sample, they strain by about two to four percent, and it's somewhat uniform. In the GA treated samples, there's this clear gradient here. You've got the cells at the bottom, and they deform by zero to two percent. Then you've got these cells at the top and they deformed about 10 percent and so this gradient really matches what we saw with which cells are growing so the cells that are able to grow in response to ga are the same ones that have this more extensible property so this shows a good a good relation why the cells at the bottom are not able to extend is a good question we're still looking into this um, the theory at the moment is that because they're already quite long, these cells, they might have already extended and perhaps they've strain stiffened and they're not able to expand anymore at this time. And so I'm beginning to be able to characterize the mechanical properties of these growing tissues. There's still a lot to do, obviously. But I'm also going to show you some of the things I'm doing to understand the role of mechanical feedback in informing plant growth. And this is again in relation to the hypocotyl. So one of its jobs is to get these cotyledons out of the soil. So you can see it pushing up here. And I wanted to know what's going on at this point. And I specifically wanted to look at the microtubules of what they were doing. And so why microtubules? Well, they were shown very nicely by Olivier Hamann that they reorient and align with mechanical stress. So this is an image of a meristem where they've made a hole in the center of it. And this changes the stress pattern. And so the microtubules reorient with this new stress pattern. And so, as I said before, microtubules have a role in guiding the deposition of cellulose fibers, and this changes the anisotropy of the cell wall. So if the microtubules are like this, the cellulose fibers are probably like this, and so then the cells are more likely to expand like this, and if it's the other way around. And so you have the potential for this feedback between the mechanical stress and the directions of growth. And so before we can say what's happening to the microtubules when it's pushing through the soil, are they aligning with stresses? We need to say what is the stress pattern normally in this hypocotyl. In the meristem, the stress pattern can be nicely predicted from the geometry. So if you take a, an idealized meristem geometry, you inflate it like a balloon, then you get this distribution of stresses. And the microtubules show a good alignment with the predicted stresses. So in the center, they're sort of disordered, and this matches this isotropic stress distribution. In the boundary region, there's compression, and the microtubules align like this. And then in the stem region, you have more of these circumferential uh, stresses, which again matches the microtubules. And so I started off by saying, OK, maybe the hypocotyl is the same. It's just a cylinder with some pressure inside it. Let's go with that. And so if you have a pressurized cylinder, then the main direction of stress is always this way. This is called the hoop stress. 
And this is true for any pressurized cylinder. So the classic way to show this is with sausages, because if you cook sausages, they always explode this way, if you didn't remember to prick them. And so this pattern of, uh, of exploding here tells you that the stresses were this way. And so if we look at the microtubule orientation in a light grown hypercotyl, the cotyledons are up here, we've got a root down here, then they're showing this longitudinal alignment. And that is not matching the predicted stress pattern. So either we've predicted the stress pattern incorrectly, or the microtubules are not aligning with the stress pattern. These are the options. And so if we think about the hypercotyl, maybe it's not just a pressurized cylinder. There's all these cells inside, and they might be doing something. A lot of nice work has been done of peeling and cutting hypercotyls, and this allows you to see tissue tension. So these are differences between the, the stresses in the different layers, which can be caused by differential growth or the geometry or pressure. And you'll see this not in Arabidopsis, but in a, a sunflower, in a hypercotyl. If you go to your fridge, you can take out a carrot, you can make some cuts, and you can look at what happens to that tissue. And you'll see that the outside part of the, of the tissue, the epidermis here, it shrinks, and the inside part elongates. So this tells you that there are tissue tensions existing in the sample. And like I said, this is really hard to do in Arabidopsis, but Stefan Berger did some beautiful work using a Quasimodo mutant, which has cell adhesion defects, and was able to see that when the cells were falling apart due to this uh, adhesion defect, they always came apart in the same way. So the cracks were like this. And this tells you that the stress is indeed longitudinal in the epidermis. And so what kind of model do we need to explain this if a pressurized cylinder is not enough? So I went to the next simplest thing. This is a finite element model that I made in the software Abacus. These are um, fluid cavity elements, so you can have pressure. And you can specify the pressure you want for the inner part and for the outer part. And we can also specify the properties of the cell wall. And if we make everything equal and isotropic, then you get this um, sausage type effect. It's sort of, you inflate it, and then you have these circumferential stresses here. So the red arrows are the maximum stress direction, and the yellow ones are the minimum stress direction. And so it looks like this. Now, if we make a small change, so we increase the pressure in the inside, and we make it anisotropic, so we're reinforcing it in the hoop direction, then we can see that we can get these hoop stress directions here. And that transmits to the epidermis longitudinal uh, stresses. And so now we have this difference in stresses in the inside and the outside. And so this gives us a model where we can now use this to apply our experiment of pushing through soil to see what would happen to the stresses. In order to see if our model was perhaps plausible, we looked at what the microtubules were doing in the inner layer as well as the outer layer. So the outer layer data I already showed you, the microtubules are mostly longitudinally aligned, whereas in the inner layer, they're mostly circumferential. And so this is matching the stress patterns that we're getting in our model now. Okay, so what is happening when it's pushing through the soil? How can we even look at this? So I put the hypercotyl into my little extensometer and I just held it still so it couldn't move at all. And then the plant tries to grow and it just pushes really hard to try and escape. And you can see the force being generated here. And eventually the plant just buckles and sort of tries to get out of my machine. And you can see a little bit of microtubule reorientation associated with that. But if we allow the plant to grow in the machine, so we set the machine to keep force at zero, this means as the plant is pushing and growing, the machine keeps moving a little bit so that the plant can grow. Then we can see that we get the plant growing in the machine and we're holding zero force like this. This is because of the capabilities of this feedback loop. Then if we plasmalize the tissue, we can see what the force is normally generated due to the turga inside. And we saw this to be about two millinewtons 
in these turgid cells versus the plasmalized cells. And so I decided a good physiologically relevant amount of force to apply, at least for a start, would be about half this. So I applied one millinewton. So we set it up so that the plants would either experience one extra millinewton of tension or one millinewton of compression while they were growing. So they're still growing, but they're experiencing this extra force, either pulling them or compressing them. So this is as if you're growing, but you're still pushing against something as you're growing. So you can't grow as much as you want to. And then we put the sample under the microscope. We applied these uh, perturbations and we watched them for 24 hours to see what was happening to the microtubules. And what we saw was that in the zero force, the microtubule orientation remained mostly longitudinal. In the tension one, it was quite similar. However, in the compression situation, we got this reorientation and the microtubules became circumferential. And we could do this in, uh, in series, so we can apply tension and then compression. We can see microtubules turning and then they're sort of turning back. So we can have some fun with this. And we applied the same things to our model. So we tried compressing the model or putting it under tension. And we saw that the stresses should reorient in the epidermis when it's under compression, and they should remain longitudinal when it's under tension. And then we saw that the stresses in the inside layer remain circumferential in both experiments. And when we looked at the microtubules, we saw that the microtubules were always circumferential. And in the compression, they were turning, and in the tension one, they were remaining mostly longitudinal. The alignment is not perfect. There is some sample variation and possibly some geometric uh, effects from the sample. And also a very nice recent paper showed that there might actually be some active mechanism to prevent all of the microtubules aligning with stress so that you don't get an over response to mechanics, which is kind of cool. But then we looked at what was happening to the growth while we were doing this experiment. So as I told you, the sample is growing, but it's experiencing a bit of force on it. And so in the zero force situation, it was like this. Over time, in the tension one, they grew like this. These are the same cells that I showed you the microtubule data for. Under relative compression, however, they showed this huge acceleration in growth. They were really growing more when they had this relative compressive force on them. You'll notice that two samples didn't respond. And these are the same two samples whose microtubules didn't reorient. And so I think this gives an indication that this microtubule reorientation is required for this increase in growth that we see in the compressed uh, samples. And so basically, when the plant is growing normally, we have this inside reinforcement of the hoop stress, which is transmitting this longitudinal stress to the epidermis, and it's resisting it. And this leads to a sort of slow growth. Whereas when it hits the obstacle, you get this change in the stress pattern, you get a reorientation of the microtubules, and then it's not reinforced anymore against the pressure from the inside, and so the growth really accelerates. This is my current, my current idea about how the hypercodal might be trying to push through here. Obviously, there's other aspects as well, including light and hormones and many things. But I think this is a, a very nice, Thing where compression alone is also enabling the plant to really accelerate. And so this is how I'm currently studying morphogenesis. I've showed you some examples of where I've been trying to do some characterization of mechanical properties in growing tissues and how I'm trying to understand mechanical feedbacks. And with that, I want to thank the people who were involved in the parts I've spoken about. So Nihao was very important in building the extensor meter and Pierre, there's a lot of help with the image analysis. And I also want to thank everybody at SLCU, where I am now, for giving me a very warm welcome. And hopefully we'll get some very nice results to show you soon. Um, yeah, I can take questions at this point. A wonderful talk. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, we have a couple of questions, and, and quite some of them relate to the um, method of this extensometer. Uh, Sisu Balan Natarayan, for example, um, asks how you identify or understand the nature of different cells 
uh, like dermal cells, cortical cells, or vascular cells in the view of, of this uh, elasticity and plasticity with this method. How I understand the properties of the different tissues? Yeah, I, I guess the question is um, from, I mean, which tissue basically is, is most decisive for the measurement? Mm, yeah, this is a good question. So the part that is the most informative for the measurement is the load bearing part. So you don't need to know what it is. Um, whatever is the, the sort of stiffest part is the part that you won't be able to stretch. So that's the part you will, you will feel. And so people always think it's the epidermis. Um, but what we're measuring is the total of everything. And so mm -hmm. the thing that's going to influence your measurement the most is whatever is influencing the growth the most, because you're pulling on the whole thing at the same time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, makes sense. But then that would also mean that if you have some treatments or mutants that have changes in vascularization, for example, that would bias uh, the, the measurement as well, right? Yes, it would. And I think this is a very nice direction to go in to try and change things in the different layers and see what the different contribution of the layers is. Because some layers, perhaps you change them and then you don't see a change in your measurement. And then you can be like, oh, perhaps that layer is not contributing too much to the overall mechanics in that tissue. So, yeah, this yeah. will be really nice to investigate further. Yeah. Uh, Juan Alonso Serra uh, is wondering about the microtubuli orientation in the hypercotyls and whether they are more proportional to the stress or to the strain. So, I think that it's the stress because as I showed in the ones that were being compressed they were actually growing more so they ended up longer but they had a compressive stress acting upon them. Um, Billy Tasker Brown is, is wondering uh, whether you also see changes in cell division when you apply uh, compression or extension to the tissue. The hypocotyl typically doesn't divide very much it has just a couple of sort of stomatal type divisions. So there's not enough divisions for us to comment on that in the hypocotyl. Mm -hmm. And that would also not change uh, if, if you compress? Yeah, no, it doesn't divide. We don't induce division in the hypocotyl by compressing it. Mm -hmm. um, then Yan Bing Wang is wondering if the compression force, I mean, the, the increase in growth that you see, whether this is plant stage dependent. It might be. Um, we're using hypocotyls that are actively growing. If you took a hypocotyl that wasn't trying to grow, then it might not respond in the same way. I think this is quite possible, but I haven't actually tested it. Mm -hmm. uh, Martha Pellman is, is wondering about uh, whether the epidermis is simplastically isolated from the inner tissue and how, how is the difference in toga pressure achieved? I think they are symplastically isolated, but I'm not 100% sure. I thought they were less connected at least. Um, but how the difference in pressure is achieved, I guess, would require some, some difference in the symplast. For now, it's only a hypothesis because it's very hard to measure turgor pressure, especially in the tiny cells of, of a hypocotyl. Um, you can imagine the opposite would be harder to achieve if you had higher pressure in the epidermis compared to the inside, because then it would sort of crush inwards. Um. And Henrik Buschmann says hi, and um, he wonders why many people have seen transverse microtubuli in epidermal cells of hypercotyls. Oh, is that not in the dark? So these are light grown hypercotyls. Mm -hmm. They're grown in continuous light. And so in this situation, they're longitudinal. I think once you move them to the dark, then they reorient. And this could be light signaling alone, or it could be because you get a softening of the epidermis, which means you have a change in the stress pattern between the different tissues, which would then cause them to reorient. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Katie Brown is wondering whether touch response uh, plays a role in, in your um in your measurement? Mm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't see a response immediately. It takes quite a few hours and we hold them under the stress for a few hours to see a response. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, Sebastian Moreno and, and also some other people, uh, they, they are wondering about other tissues uh, such as uh, leaves or cotton ledens and, and whether you can also measure um, the forces there with, with your approach. I can, yes. Um, the interpretation is a little bit more difficult because they don't have a uniform width. So you need really to make a model or think about how you're going to interpret the data. But you can you can put these tissues in the machine and you can apply stresses to them. Then you just need to think about what the stress that each cell is seeing, if it's above a vein or if it's above a thicker part of the leaf or a thinner part, for example. Because the hypercodal is more uniform when you're applying the stress. So it's a little simpler to interpret. But in theory, yes, it, it can be done. Yeah, and then I mean there, there are still um, a lot of open questions here and, and I can see from the question that that your talk really triggered the, the, their interest because they um, kind of point to to some open questions. So one of them is for example here Job Vermeer, maybe I take this one as, as the last one. Um, he he wonders whether the the stretching results in fast calcium signaling. Um, maybe I tried to look at calcium, but it's so quick. Uh that I kind of induced it when I was first mounting it. And then, yeah, we didn't look at it too much after that. We're looking at more at sort of a slow, slow response. I think calcium, you get a response by just a tiny touch on the cell. And I think my approach maybe is too brutal at the moment for looking at calcium. All right, great. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for the nice uh, presentation and also for the discussion with, uh, with the audience. Thanks. Um, and I think we've seen um, two wonderful talks and uh, very good questions. And I also saw that, um, well, we were fully booked. Um, so we, we hit the maximum number of, of people attending. And what was also nice was that uh, the, the number of attendees didn't dramatically drop uh, down when, um, when, when Ottoline um, gave the mic to, to, to Sarah. So showing that there was a lot of um, interest in, in, in both talks. and. Uh, and people stayed alert. Um, yeah. Katie, do you, do you want to? Thank you all yeah. for joining us. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us for this first, first meeting of Plante Presents. I'm really excited to see this series grow. Um, like, like Jurgen just mentioned, we had 900 people register and we currently only have 500 seats open. So we are lo looking for sponsors to hopefully be able to make this open and broad to everyone, because um, we would like to be able to have the budget to, you know, turn up the dial on the seats that we're available to offer. Um, we will be posting the recording of this webinar along with any questions that we weren't able to get to on our, our new Plante Presents page. Um, if you go to plante.org, um, under the drop down for education, you'll see all of the associated resources there, as well as our schedule for upcoming talks. If you're interested in volunteering to be a presenter, we do have a form available on that website for you to fill out with your abstract and your title. Um, we're in the process of building out the schedule for May and we've already had quite a few people volunteer to talk. So it's pretty exciting and I, I'm glad that um, this is something that's of interest to our community. Thanks again to Jurgen and to, to Benjamin Schlesinger for really catalyzing this project and getting it off the ground. I um, really appreciate it. And, We'll see you next week, hopefully, um, or the week after. We're trying to alternate time zones to, to reach different parts of the world. But if you have any questions, just let us know at community at plante.org. And with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and close.